Natural Resources University is pleased to introduce one of our newest series, Working Wild U, hosted by Alex Few and Jared Beaver. Then when the wolves were turned out of their pens in Yellowstone Park, the Soda Butte pack immediately came here. Welcome back to Working Wild You, a show where we explore what it means to share the working landscape with people and wildlife from the crossroads of culture and science. I'm Jared Beaver. And I'm Alex Few. And they denned up here. And you can imagine, we were torn between all of our neighbors and all the ranchers who, who just were going to shoot, shovel, and shut up. But we made the decision that we weren't going to do anything until we had a problem. Shoot, shovel, and shut up. When wolves are reintroduced into Yellowstone, they return to a landscape of fear where many folks, including livestock producers, had grown accustomed to their absence. And change can often be challenging. The return of wolves added a new dimension to what it means to live in the working wild, whether you saw that as a positive or a negative. We spoke with Julia Childs. She lives on her family ranch, homesteaded by her grandfather in 1901. And there, Julia's family runs cattle, yearlings to be exact, just north of Yellowstone Park on the short grass prairie. So really, when wolves were first reintroduced to Yellowstone National Park in January of 1995, it was basically just a hop, skip, and jump for them to make it over to her neck of the woods. And arrive they did. Within a year of the Yellowstone reintroduction, a pack set up camp at Julia's Ranch. We weren't going to assume that the wolves were going to be a problem to us. We were going to just hold our breath and sit in our chairs until um, something happened. Years before reintroduction, Julia's family decided to run contract yearling cattle. That's their business model for this ranch. And we think that one reason the wolves don't bother them very much, besides the fact that they're not used to eating them, they're not their favorite food when they first came. And we had elk and we had deer, so they, they, didn't, they didn't bother our cattle very much. The short and the skinny of it is calves are pretty easy prey for wolves. Yearling cows are just bigger, and that makes them less vulnerable to predation. That's kind of been our relationship with the whole thing, trying to acknowledge the fact that a lot of our neighbors have a cow-calf operation, and that's a very different thing than yearlings when it comes to wolves. So a lot of Julia's neighbors all have cow-calf operations, which means you breed mamas to have calves in the spring, and that provides more reason to worry. And it's been very interesting to me to watch the neighbors because they really have a cultural inherited fear and hatred of wolves that doesn't make sense because we have mountain lions. So people with sheep, they lose a lot more sheep to mountain lions. And now we have grizzly bears and grizzly bears are way worse than the wolves ever were packed den on a ridgeline close enough to the ranch house that Julia and her family spent their evenings watching the pack through a spotting scope. And so we would go up and sit on a hill somewhere and watch them and we were fascinated. And then we'd go to the meeting with the ranchers who were all hooping and hollering and upset. And then we'd come back and watch our wolves. They're wolves. So wolves were reintroduced into Yellowstone National Park and they returned to a social landscape that largely didn't support their return. And that was because they were reintroduced into a landscape of fear and uncertainty. Yeah, lots and lots of uncertainty. For example, would cow-calf operations hold up with added predators? Are the ungulate populations going to decline? Is the federal government going to use wolves in the Endangered Species Act as a Trojan horse to control land use? Those are the same questions that we're still asking today. But Julia made a conscious decision to sit with uncertainty and to come to her own conclusions on what it would be like to live alongside wolves. 
Uh, so that first year, when they denned up there, and they had a litter, in the middle of June, they decided they were going to come in and get them and move them back into the park and put them back in an enclosure in the southern part of the park. Wolf managers in the park got pretty anxious because they thought the pack would get into trouble. Back to this landscape of fear thing, Alex. So they made an effort to bring them back over to the park. And so a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologist literally crawled into the den headfirst, hoping it was empty, except for the pups. The pups were about this this big, like, like German Shepherd puppies that are about three months old. And then with them in our backpacks, we hiked down to the, where the helicopter was, and uh, they put them in a crate. They captured all of the pack except for one adult they couldn't find, and they brought them back to the park. So that was the end of the Soda Butte pack. But immediately, of course, other, another pack moved in eventually. Not, not so eventually, pretty fast. So that's what reintroduction looked like in the Northern Rockies. It's painted as a reintroduction into a protected national park. But within a year of their reintroduction, they were denning and reproducing on private ranches. So how did we get here? I mean, why were wolves being reintroduced into Yellowstone in the first place? So to understand this, we need to take a step back from Roscoe, Montana. We need to understand the motivation to reintroduce wolves in the first place. And we need to understand the policies that made it all possible. Sit tight. We'll be right back. Hey, listener. We really appreciate you listening to Working Wild U. And we have a small favor to ask. Please head over to our show notes and fill out the listener survey. We want to learn more about you and what impact this show is having. Your feedback will inform how we make the show in the future and help us obtain funding so we can continue this important work. Thank you. Now back to the show. And so wolves were actually one of the first species listed under the Endangered Species Act. Which... You may recognize that voice as Ed Bangs from an earlier episode, a now retired U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologist who was in the thick of wolf reintroduction and recovery for decades. And if we're talking about what made wolf reintroduction and recovery possible, we can't do that without talking about the Endangered Species Act. That's right. And a lot of people don't know that the Endangered Species Act was passed with overwhelming bipartisan support in 1973. Amidst a flurry of environmentally focused legislation that included the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and many others. And these actions were demanded from an American public who was undergoing a rapid value shift, one that wanted targeted legislation to conserve our country's resources. This was a time when rivers were famously catching fire because of pollution. Think the Cuyahoga in Northeast Ohio. That sparked the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency. Yeah, and momentum behind this movement and the Endangered Species Act came in part from Rachel Carson's landmark book, Silent Spring, which painted a stark picture of the effects of DDT. And the idea of the act is to bring animals back so they're no longer threatened with being totally exterminated. There are two ways that a species may come to be listed under the Endangered Species Act. First, a person or organization can request a species be listed as threatened or endangered. Or second, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service can voluntarily choose to examine the status of a species by initiating a status review. Both of these paths begin a series of decision-making processes by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And this process generally includes many opportunities for public comment. And wolves being one of the first species protected under this act, became a poster child of sorts. And really, this is just a match made in heaven because today, the Endangered Species Act, once passed with bipartisan support, is now just as controversial as its canid counterpart. So there's a lot of debate about what the Endangered Species Act is really about. And so some people think it thinks it means ecological restoration. Other people means it just barely enough that they're not going extinct, even if a bunch of them are in captivity. Uh, and so our society continues to wrestle with that. And there's all kinds of litigation, which is our way of 
fixing things. We should just do it with an ax to the head now we go to court. And wolves, being a poster child for the Endangered Species Act, are also a vessel now for the different ways these ideas can play out. And one of the major flashpoints around wolves and their recovery is about just one question. Their range. Where should they be recovered to? And this is not about the exact spot of reintroduction. This is about where they should live throughout the United States. So around the time scientists and administrative folks at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service were debating the reintroduction of wolves into Idaho and Yellowstone, wolves began coming back to the region around Glacier National Park in northwest Montana. And they were just coming down from Canada on their own. And so the real reason that reintroduction happened to central Idaho and Yellowstone was if wolves come back on their own, they were under the most protective status an endangered species can have, which is endangered, which is really strict regulations. If you reintroduce an animal, you can have much, much more liberal regulations. So when we reintroduced wolves to Yellowstone in central Idaho, we allowed ranchers, landowners to shoot and kill wolves. Um, we allowed agencies to move wolves around or kill them if they attack livestock. And this is the same debate going on in Colorado right now. What Ed Bangs is talking about here is an experimental non-essential population designation under Section 10J of the Endangered Species Act. Wow. Well, that's a mouthful. So what, what are we really talking about here? You know, I'm going to let Scott Becker with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service explain it, as he did to a room full of ranchers in Walden, Colorado. So when we talk about experimental populations, this is a special section uh, under Section 10J of, of the Endangered Species Act. And basically it allows the Fish and Wildlife Service to, to designate listed species as experimental populations when they're reintroduced outside of their current range. And so in order to do that, they need to be geographically separated from, from other populations. Basically, 10J gives the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service much more flexibility to manage a reintroduced population, which could mean selectively killing wolves that have gotten used to eating cows, like Ed mentioned. But the reintroduction in the first place and the 10J rule that allowed lethal removal of wolves almost right from the start really got the hackles up from both sides of the table. We were litigated by the people that kind of don't like wolves the most, which is American Farm Bureau at the time. And then uh, on the other side, at the same table, was the Sierra Club and Earth Justice. One side was saying, hey, you're prote- you know, we shouldn't have wolves anyway. You're protecting them way too much. You know, what you're doing is illegal. And, and it's the spaghetti approach where you just throw every possible argument against the wall and you just hope, hope that something sticks. While we don't still settle disputes with an axe to the head, like Ed mentioned earlier, litigation has become the new hatchet for interest groups on both sides of the spectrum. Litigation is being used to challenge what some see as unfair interpretations of the Endangered Species Act. And so both, both those groups were at the same table. In fact, the judge, he goes, it is not lost on me that I look at the people that are suing you are the opposite ends of the spectrum. And maybe that means we were in the middle place, or maybe that means we just pissed off everyone. (laughs) And wolves and their management is hard, right? It's nuanced and complicated. It goes well beyond science and biological management. This is emotional, social, cultural stuff. It's exactly what we mean when we say centered at the crossroads of culture and science. You can't keep everyone happy. And like so many issues in our country, wolves are a flashpoint for different visions of land use in the West. All this has nothing to do with wolves. Wolves and wolf management has nothing to do with reality. It has to do with people arguing their values with other people. And one particular statue, one area, seems to be the most hotly debated and litigated fact of delisting and relisting of wolves from the Endangered Species Act. And after the break, we'll jump right in. If you're enjoying Working Wild U, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. We would love to hear from you. And be sure to subscribe to Working Wild U wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks. Now back to the show. Litigation. Well, it's 
part of checks and balances to make sure legislation is being interpreted correctly. That's a rabbit hole for sure. When legislation leaves room for interpretation, the case history of litigation is supposed to add clarity. But what really happens? My name's Caroline Bird, and right now I'm a consultant, but my career has been in conservation. We spoke with Caroline, who worked in conservation for the Wyoming Outdoor Council, the Nature Conservancy, and as the executive director for the Greater Yellowstone Coalition, an environmental advocacy group that looks to work with all people to protect the lands, waters, and wildlife of the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And now, she's working as a private consultant. We were looking to understand how she, as an attorney and conservationist, understands the value of litigation. A lawsuit is a tool in a toolbox, and it's really just a doorstop to slow things down. Litigation is a pause. It's rarely the end, and it's rarely the solution. And when it comes to the Endangered Species Act, and specifically efforts to delist the wolf, Some environmental advocacy groups have really been mashing that pause button pretty hard. So we talked about listing a species under the Endangered Species Act, but could you explain a little bit more about what you mean by delisting? You bet. Delisting a species in theory means to remove it from the list of threatened and endangered species once it's been recovered to a significant portion of its range. At this point, the federal government will turn over decision-making power to the states to manage them. This is important because state wildlife managers and many residents within those states want autonomy in the management of wolves. Many states welcome state management because it allows regulated hunting, one tool used to control population size and one that also generates added dollars to the State Wildlife Conservation Fund through the sale of additional hunting licenses and tags. But this is really contentious because at the same time, many people are uncomfortable with the idea of state-regulated wolf hunting. It's just agreeing on how species are managed after recovery that's the real challenge. And oftentimes, that keeps species from being delisted or worse, flip-flopped back and forth. I think the ideal outcome of all of this is to get to a place where the states are managing our wildlife um, and that we don't need that federal oversight. While some environmental advocacy groups are comfortable with the idea of state-level management under certain conditions, others will fight it tooth and nail to keep them federally protected to prevent the idea of hunting. But for now, let's jump back to wolf recovery. Here's Ed Bangs, who will walk us through what it looked like as a federal wildlife manager to work towards delisting wolves. So we just, this five-factor analysis, we look at the population, you know, are there too many of them being killed? No. Is the habitat in good shape? Yep. Are there any disease or parasites that are going to get to them? No. Is climate change an issue for wolves? No. They're the most adaptable animal on the planet next to us. And, you know, we looked at all that stuff and it's like, just check the boxes. And then we went forward with a rule which has public involvement to say, here's why we think wolves should be delisted. And this is the area we think they should be delisted in. Here's the legal reasons we think we can do that. And here's the biological reasons that support the, the five the factors on listing. And then after that, people that are unhappy with the decision go to litigation. When I worked as a wildlife biologist for an endangered species recovery program, I knew the recovery goals like the back of my hand, and we were working hard to meet those goals because that meant the species could be delisted. But it turns out that delisting is about satisfying legal requirements more than it is about meeting recovery goals. And to me, that was an aha moment. And from listening to you and Ed, my aha moment is that the Endangered Species Act is quite effective at preventing listed species from going extinct, but nearly impossible to get them removed from that list once officially listed. In fact, only 2.1% of listed species have been officially recovered. For wolves specifically, All but one effort from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to delist them in the West have been overturned in the courts. 
So to give you a picture of the level of the back and forth in listing and delisting that has occurred for wolves, let's just look at Montana. In 2009, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service delisted wolves and returned their management to the state. And this was pretty short-lived because in August 2010, a U.S. District Court judge relisted the species until the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service reevaluated state laws in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming that plaintiffs argued would undermine wolf populations. And at this point, Congress intervened and did what the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service could not. Montana Senator John Tester and Idaho Congressman Mike Simpson introduced legislation that delisted the Northern Rockies population of wolves in Montana and Idaho and parts of Oregon, Washington, and Utah. And I think it's important to note that at this point, the wolf estimates in Montana were between 650 and 1,200 individuals, which is well over the delisted criteria set of at least 150 wolves in 10 breeding pairs. And so there's a lot of back and forth here between delisting, relisting, delisting. All the while, the population was growing, or at the very least, remaining stable. So how's that possible? Well, you know, we're no legal experts, but luckily we have talked to a few folks who are. My name is Karen Bud Fallon. I am a rancher in western Wyoming. I also own a small ranch in eastern Wyoming, and I'm an attorney. Lawson Fight, and I am an attorney based out of Portland, Oregon. And let's just say they have a little bit of experience on this front. And so I help do a lot of the legal review and the legal analysis to try to prepare that rule to delist the wolves in the lower 48. So under the Endangered Species Act, what defines a species range has been a hot topic of debate especially for wolves. Range can mean anything from where the species lives now to anywhere they have ever lived, or even anywhere a species could live. There's also this sticky business of distinct population segments, which are quite important to how species are delisted in regions of the United States. A distinct population segment is one that is discrete from other populations of the species and significant in relation to the entire species. So, Say for an example, the wolf population that was reintroduced into the Rockies in 1995. Yep. So important thing to bring up because establishing wolves is this distinct population segment in Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana, and parts of Oregon and Washington, allowed that specific population to be treated as its own unit of sorts. And this is what allowed the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to delist wolves in these states, as well as another distinct population segment in the Great Lakes for a brief period of time. But when it comes to delisting wolves across the lower 48, that brings up another set of questions around how the Endangered Species Act defines range. There is a confusion over whether range is current or historic, and there is some court decisions out there, particularly one from 2001, that said you have to consider the historic range in this significant portion of the range analysis, which it, it doesn't make logical sense. Lawson is arguing this because if you were to think about it, wolves once existed in every corner of the lower 48 states. If we recovered wolves to a significant portion of their historic range as criteria for countrywide delisting, would basically have them in Central Park, trapezing through downtown Denver, and slurping up hot dogs in Dodger Stadium. This just doesn't pass the common sense test. It was like these phrases just sort of got stuffed into the Endangered Species Act with loud of lot of, of discussion or understanding. And so it's impossible for all sides to come up with a durable solution. In fact, Multiple administrations have, from both sides have tried to reach such a compromise that works within the courts to define the range for the Endangered Species Act. That's right. Back in the days of the Bush administration, they tried to write a rule to define what was meant by a significant portion of range, and it didn't stand the test of time in the courts. And that's not just a one-off occasion. The Obama administration came in, and they wrote their own version of the rule, and the court said no to that too. So when the Trump administration delisted wolves in 2020, the ruling was susceptible to lawsuits, even though career scientists at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service had determined that 
all of the wolf populations in the lower 48 had recovered. Right, Alex. Susceptible it was, as it was overturned this year, 2022, after three different suits were filed to relist. One of the claims was wolves had not yet been recovered to a significant portion of their range. These gaps, gaps in the connection between recovery goals and a recovery plan and how a species is delisted, gaps in how range is defined and how that gets interpreted by the courts, it's these gaps that allow this litigation cycle, delisting, relisting, delisting, relisting, to be more about values and about our different visions for the future of wolves in the West. So there's always an appropriate place for litigation, but it's like hammering a nail and you keep hammering it and hammering it and hammering it and that nail's not going in. And in fact, it's popping back out at you. Put the hammer down. You know, use a different tool or ask yourself, is that the right nail? Coming back to Caroline, as the former director of the Greater Yellowstone Coalition, often referenced as GYC, she had to balance decisions on when to use litigation and when to try and build diverse coalitions that address challenges to the landscape. And sometimes the former made the latter a little more difficult. Like, no, we'll never talk to you because you were those bomb throwers. And it may or may not have been GYC, but people remember. It's like, no, no, you sued me. You went after me. I'm like, ah, right, yeah, no. Now we have to start all over in building a bridge. While Caroline is proud of some of the litigation she spearheaded, including stopping a mine from potentially polluting the Yellowstone River just outside of the park, she stresses that there's also a place for collaboration to further more meaningful, long-lasting solutions. But in the context of litigation around wolves, it seems often these lawsuits are pitting wildlife advocates who often want wolves to remain listed against agricultural interest groups who want them delisted undermining any efforts of good faith to find common ground, identify common values, and find a path forward to maintain working lands and wildlife in the West. And we're not trying to point fingers here. There's opportunities to find middle ground, to move forward incorporating the values and visions of both supposed sides of this debate. The answer there is, okay, let's sit down and talk together because you're losing a bunch of calves and we're losing a bunch of wildlife. So how are, let's, let's work on this and let's build that trust and let's build that 80%, that win-win. That's not a win-lose. It's win-wins we need to find as wildlife managers, livestock producers, researchers, and wildlife advocates. One that supports thriving working lands that provide wildlife habitat in a changing West. It's in finding where our values overlap, such as appreciation for the open spaces and wild places of the American West, where we can start building bridges across this diverse group of folks. Building bridges and finding win-wins for working lands and wildlife is a big part of the solution and a good place to end this episode. So coming up in our next episode, we'll talk about what really happens when wolves follow Little Red Riding Hood or more likely your dog, to grandma's house. Wolves in town. This is going to be a really fun episode. See you next time. Working Wild U is a production of Montana State University Extension and Western Landowners Alliance, with support from the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation, Western Sayre, and listeners like you. Today's episode was directed and edited by Zach Altman and produced by Matthew Collins, Zach Altman, Alex Few, Jared Beaver, and Abby Nelson. Our hosts are Jared Beaver and Alex Few. Lewis Wirtz is our executive producer. Music is from Artlist and Blue Dot Sessions. Thanks to Kathleen Shannon for helping edit this episode. And special thanks to Julia Childs, Ed Bangs, Caroline Bird, Karen Bud Fallen, Lawson Fight, Scott Becker, and Nick Mott. Follow Working Wild U on social media for updates and explore our show notes and bonus content on our website at workingwild.us. Please consider rating and reviewing the show on Apple Podcasts and share this episode with a friend or neighbor. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.